everybody. Testing, testing. There we go. How is everybody? Great. So I'm Frank Vaughn, if you don't know. Um, and I will be the MC and moderator for tonight's event. But before we do anything, I really want to say thanks to all of you for coming tonight and pushing back against the fascism that's happening outside. I just also want to make a quick observation that's not on my list. Looking out at this crowd, we are the most terrible white supremacist organization in the history of the planet. We fail at it. But before we get into it, uh, I want to introduce to you Kelly Day. She flew all the way from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan at her, at, at, at her own expense just to sing us the national anthem. The real version, not a fake one. Kelly. introduce our speaker for the evening before we get into the actual uh, conversation portion. I want to thank the many people and organizations who helped make this event possible. All the EDAs who funded and got this thing started, all the people at headquarters who uh, organized and, and went out of their way logistically and otherwise, and to the security. I mean, let's hear it for Mohawk for letting us come. <laughs> I don't know if this is the first time, but it's definitely one of the most prominent times we didn't back down from the bullies. That's for sure. Now, I'd like to welcome a man who needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. He is a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. He's a former columnist for the London Free Press and the Toronto Sun, and has contributed to various publications like the National Review, in the Middle East Forum. He is an author, a speaker, an activist, and a man who has been much maligned by the encroaching cloud of mainstream censorship, which affects all of us. He has received numerous awards and accolades for his expertise in various fields. He's a Muslim. He's an immigrant and a staunch advocate for free speech and free expression. It is my honor to introduce my friend and our PPC candidate in London North Centre, 
Professor Salim Mansour. <laughs> Great to be here. Here this evening, we were to meet and listen to a conversation between Dave Rubin, the well regarded host of the show in America on YouTube videos, and Maxime Bernier, our much Love leader of the People's Party of Canada. It was arranged as a follow up to an earlier conversation between the two that aroused immense public interest in both our countries, Canada and the United States. We simply assume in our Canada we could gather openly and engage in any conversation we wish to have without contemplating that what we take for granted in our day-to-day -day lives in one of the oldest democracies in the world would stir a nest of hornets, of gnats, and worse, in our midst to stop us from doing what generations of Canadians have done in peace and in harmony. So here we meet at Mohawk College in Hamilton, Ontario, not simply to attend a conversation between Dave Rubin and Maxime Bernier, not simply to show our resolve that we Canadians and we will not demean ourselves now or ever stoop to the diversity crowd in labeling with prefixes of color and gender and ethnicity, who we are as Canadians. For we are Canadian, one and all, pledged to a country true not strong and free. We will not be intimidated. We will not be coerced the threaten with violence to do, not to do what a God-given and constitutionally protected right to do, but also to stand on God for our much-loved Canada, the dominion of peace, order, and good government from sea to shining sea. Here, we are met for what was scheduled to be a joyful event of sharing and exploring and learning about issues that bring us together across Canada under Maxine's leadership into a test of where we are headed as a country, a test of our democracy, a test of who we are as a people and whether, as Canadians, we are truly worthy to protect the legacy 
bequeathed to us by Sir John A. Macdonald and Sir Wilfred Laurier. So, my friends, we meet this evening and go forward from here. Upon us is the added burden of being Canada's defenders of freedom of speech. We take this burden. We take this burden proudly and with quiet determination, as Canadians have done before us. And so, we are resolved as the progeny of those Canadians who stood their ground at Wyme Ridge, who stormed the beaches in Dieppe and Normandy, who fought and died in defending freedom and saving Europe twice from the forces of totalitarianism in the last century. We resolve that we in the PPC will not be silenced by smears or intimidation or threats of violence in protecting free speech for all Canadians. Yeah. Note, my friends, that the establishment parties and the leaders in our parliament, the liberals, the conservatives, the new democrats and the greens are missing. Their silence in defending free speech in Canada rings painfully loud across our land and Canadians can now without any ambiguity distinguish that apart from Maxime and the PPC and common, hard-working, law-abiding, tax-paying citizens of our great country, the Canadian elite in politics, in business, in the media, in the academia, have gone to bed with those who seek to wreck our basic rights while pandering to the globalists and the Islamists with the borderless one world UN contrived agenda. But why is this so, my friends? Why is this so? <coughs> the answer is not complicated. The struggle for freedom or between the right to be free as an individual, as a people, on the one hand, and to abridge or construct, constrict freedom or coerce people and deny the right to be free, on the other hand, is as old as the story of Cain and Abel, or the flight of the Hebrews led by Moses from the oppression of the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. My friends, it is quite significant that we meet this evening on Rosh Hashanah in the Jewish calendar, the day that commemorates the Lord's creation of our world. It is fitting 
that on this holy evening of Rosh Hashanah, we commit ourselves once again to keep secure our free speech as never before. This commitment of ours is also not complicated to explain. Maxime understands well what Liu Xiaobo, the late prisoner of conscience in communist China and the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize laureate observed, that freedom of speech is the mother of all freedoms. If free speech is a bridge and constrain and whittle down, then all of our other freedoms are consequently shriveled and contracted. Maxim also understands what the other great Nobel laureate in literature, Elias Canetti, who survived the Third Reich, wrote that the origin of freedom lies in breathing. Maxime and we, the PPC, will not stop breathing. <laughs> nor allow anyone nor allow anyone to coerce us not to breathe. We will breathe. We will hold secure our freedom. So I'm here addressing my remarks to you, my fellow Canadians, and especially to those who are in your 30s or younger. It is very likely your fundamental value is personal freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of belief, freedom of movement, freedom to explore and innovate, freedom from government of any sort that tell you what you're allowed to think or think about and what you're not allowed to do. Freedom is fundamental for growth. Freedom is to be alive. And freedom is God's gift to each one of us. God gave us free will to be free and not be submissive as serfs or slaves to anyone. To love freely and not to be coerced into submission and fake love out of fear of anyone. Sadly today, if you look at the policies and practices of the present liberal government and the main opposition party, the conservative, the new democrats and the green, our freedoms are being eroded on the basis of political correctness. This is how it works. First, one of the parties introduces a non-binding motion, such as Motion 103 on Islamophobia, that sounds like it is protecting a perceived persecuted group. Then, this non-binding motion on resolution is given teeth through government funding to support the very same lobbyists and NGOs who initially came up with the idea of the motion. Then the academics join in and argue that if you want to disagree with any or all of this and lecture at a university or college such as this, you have to pay an exorbitant security fee for privately sponsored events. 
as you may be attacked verbally or physically by those who might disagree with you. I have experienced this personally as have others, such as Jordan Peterson of the University of Toronto. The sponsors, the sponsors had to double or quadruple the security payment close to the last minute before the event in which I spoke and escort me after the event to the subway for fear of an attack. My friends, is this freedom of speech? No. Is this where our country has been heading of late? Is this right that in the natural course of disagreements, when individuals who refuse to bend to political correctness are smeared as racists and bigots, such were and still remain the modus operandi of governments in communist China, Cuba, Iran, Turkey, the Arab Middle East, Russia, the former Soviet Union, North Korea, etc. And that this is the direction in which we are headed unless we firmly defend our freedoms before we are dispossessed of them. And of course, and of course, I am not telling you anything new by relating the fact that the present Liberal government of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, with little or no opposition, decided to subsidize the already largely pro-government media to the tune of nearly $600 million. Do you think, do you think for a moment that they will subsidize their critics? <laughs> Hardly. Hardly, my friends. Let me tell you bluntly, the People's Party of Canada under Maxime is the only party in the country that wants to increase, not decrease, your personal freedom. Maxime Bernier, Maxime Bernier is the only leader and member of parliament adamantly opposed to any curtailment of our freedoms. I will conclude with a hymn or song, a prayer composed by modern India's greatest poet, Rabindranath Tagore. He was the first Asian in 1913 to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. The great Irish poet William Butler Yeats, also a Nobel laureate, hailed Tagore as the embodiment of the great ancient sages of the East in his time. Here is the hymn in English translation. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow and domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where the tireless striving stretches its arm towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action. 
into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Shalom, salam, peace, and God bless Canada. Now, on to the main event. The first member of our panel started out as a journalist. He was a print features writer and later moved to television, receiving rewards from TV Ontario and the Radio Television News Directors Association for his work. He has been a high school teacher, a college professor, a professional musician, and I can genuinely say one of the most fluid and enjoyable motivational speakers I've ever heard. He is currently an associate professor at Sir Wilfrid Laurier, where he landed himself in some controversy for stepping up to defend Lindsay Shepard. Do you know who she is? <laughs> Suffice it to say, he's a staunch defender of free speech. I'm talking, of course, our PPC candidate for Cambridge, Professor David Haskell. <laughs> Our next guest is an American political commentator, YouTube personality, and talk show host. He is, uh, he is the creator and host of the Rubin Report and formerly part of the Young Turks Network and Aura TV, and he previously hosted the Ben and Dave Show and the Six Pack. Well, we all got to start somewhere. <laughs> he is often considered to be a conservative or libertarian commentator, but he prefers to self-identify as a classical liberal, and I think that's a little bit more apt. The story of his intellectual evolution and his leaving of the left is one of the most compelling that I've ever become familiar with. May I introduce David Rubin. <laughs> And last, but certainly not least, the man who broke away from the corruption of establishment politics in Canada to strike a new political path and give Canadians a real choice in our national culture. He is a lawyer, an expert in the field of economics, a man with foreign policy experience. His political experience, in fact, dwarfs everybody else running to be prime minister right now, running for the job. Probably all together. He exudes integrity, principle, consistency, self-sacrifice, and courage in pursuit of his hope to wake Canada up to a new set of possibilities. He leads by example, and I've seen this myself. He drives himself to squeeze every last hour of every single day in his hope for Canada, in his belief in Canada, and the value systems that we share. It's my high honor and my distinct privilege to introduce Canada's leading defender of freedom, fairness, personal responsibility, and respect, the leader of the People's Party of Canada, Maxime Bernier. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just say very quickly before we start that you guys probably know I did about 12 or 15 stops in Canada with Jordan Peterson in the last year and the worst thing I was called was a fascist but tonight I got called a Nazi. <laughs> Well, you've had that going on for a couple days now. Yeah, so I feel like I've arrived. So it's good to be here, everybody. 
Well, I'd actually like to, to start with you, Dave. Free speech is obviously the cornerstone of Western civilization, and every one of us on this stage has taken risks in defense of it. Um, you are a free speech advocate, and that is an understatement. What made you decide as an American to come to Canada and take this risk of coming in here to stand up for free speech right here? Well, you know, I think most of you know my story, which is why a lot of you were groaning when he said the Young Turks, and well done. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, was, I was a lefty, I was a progressive. I, I know what that is, what that sense of collectivism is. I know what that, that knee-jerk response to believe that any one of you people in this room, because you take some position, not, not even an array of positions, but because you take one or two mild positions, perhaps on taxes or, or something like that, that's outside of progressive groupthink, that they decide to label all of us racist, homophobes, bigots, Nazis, the rest of it. And I started seeing that argument, not only repeatedly, but exclusively. And the more that I saw it, I thought, this can't be right. This is, this is too easy. Even if we're right, whatever that, whatever that means, so even if when I was on the left, we were right about some policy issues, it can't possibly be that all of our opponents, all of our intellectual sparring partners, are these evil uh, forces of nature or something like that. And as I woke up to that, suddenly, and this was the shocking part, and I think this is sort of what put me on the map, is that I couldn't believe that I found all of these people on the right, I mean, basically you guys, who were absolutely open to agreeing to disagree, to, to hash out issues, to not be any of the things that I was told that you were. And all I've done really is, is been very open about my adventure. And I think it's, it's somehow, I mean, look, when, when Max and I sat down on my show, you know, I saw so here's this politician in Canada talking about free speech. People want me to talk to him, let's do it. And then I, I felt something happen here. So it's an honor to be here with you guys. And there is something that is truly worldwide happening right now. There is something going across the West. If you believe in freedom. Truly, I mean, this is true. If you believe in freedom, if you believe in the sovereignty of the individual, that we should have individual rights, th that is the cornerstone of Western society, of your society here in Canada, and my society at home in the United States, and all over Western Europe and the rest of it. We are now officially in the fight to defend that. And that is not a racist principle, that is not a bigoted principle, or any other of those phobes, or any of those things. Uh, it, is the, it is actually the most important principle. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be on stage with you guys. And I thank you for having me. Also, and, yeah. Yeah. If, I may, if I may add, um, yes, fighting for freedom, I think it's the most important fight that we must do, and we are doing that together. Um, and I always have the question about why creating the People's Party. Uh, when I did that, I thought that I'll be alone and, you know, but I'll fight for what I believe. And actually, after a month, we had more than 28,000 funding members, and now it's a growing uh, movement, more than a political party. And for me, as a politician, fighting for freedom is fighting for having real debates. And we don't have that in Canada right now, and at the university also. There's too many taboo subjects. And when we are starting a discussion, sometimes the other part, the left, they don't want to jump in that discussion with real arguments. And that's what I don't like in politics right now. Uh, and that's why you know our candidates and everybody <clears throat> that are with us, they're free to speak and to debate. And I'm so disappointed that during that election, the Conservative Party of Canada said to their candidates, don't do any debates, don't do any debates. But that's the basic of our civilization, to debate. We think we have the right ideas because they're based on freedom and personal responsibility. And we are ready to debate. And I want to thank our candidates and everybody across the country that are helping us to build this party and fight for our principle. But you can count on us, on me, to bring the subject that are important, like uh, speaking about immigration, speaking about free speech, speaking against Bill uh, C-16 and all these crazy uh, 
leftist uh, proposal, but it's only the beginning for us. And you know that at, in the I campus didn't... also. Well, you, you cleared something. Well, first of all, everybody's probably like, who the heck is the guy on the side? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I, I tagged along from the restaurant. <laughs> I, I said, hey, hey, uh, aren't you Maxine Brindley? And I said, who's the guy you're with? <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm running uh, as a candidate for the People's Party in Cambridge, but I didn't realize, did, is this true that the conservatives are saying to their candidates, don't go to the debates? Absolutely. When I was, <laughs> when I was uh, running for the Conservative Party of Canada in, 12, in 2015, the last general election, that was <clears throat> the, you know, everything must be controlled. Uh, and, and you know it must be in line with the uh, the subject of the day or the the news of the day, and they didn't want any candidates to do any debates. And I received some phone calls. I was running for the conservative in 2015. Some phone calls from some candidates in Quebec, and they were asking me advice. Maxime, do you think I must be there at that debate in my riding? And I were always said yes. You want to be their representative. You must be there. You must debate. But actually, that's a position from the Conservative Party of Canada. You see, that, that fascinates me because I just thought they were afraid to debate me. <laughs> oh, but, but now, You're not special, Dave. Now my head is just a bit smaller. I, I really thought that I was that threatening. But, but that, that is, you know, the, the problem with that is, like, that is the height of disrespect for your constituents. Yeah. Right? But, you know, there, there's something else at play here. It's that when you've been able to control the dialogue by labeling all of your opponents these horrible things, your ideas actually get flat and lazy. They, they don't get worked out. You don't have the intellectual sparring to be able to figure out what you really think and be able to stand across from someone that you disagree with and make your point clearly. And I think what happened, and the reason so much of this is connected through YouTube and podcasts, is that as over the last 10 years, you guys were able to find other ways to get information, and in a really fast way with a huge wide array of people, suddenly you heard all of these things from people that you couldn't hear about before. And on the other side, they were going, well, it's worked. It's worked to call everybody a racist for this long, so why even debate them? And I think that's why, you know, with the CBC and some of the things you guys are dealing with up here, you have trouble just getting talked about. Absolutely. But as, uh, as Eric Weinstein, who I'm sure many of you guys know, mentioned on my show, one of the type, fake news is not just that they're selling something that's dishonest. Fake news is also that they won't cover certain things. So be aware, be aware. Look how many people are here tonight, right really. According, according to the media, you do not exist. Yeah. <laughs> you're all superheroes. You're all invisible people. Yeah. You do not exist. Jedi. You're, you're Jedi. Jedi. You're all, all Jedi. And if I may add on that, uh, we did a rally in Vancouver last week. We had 500 people over there. We had the CBC and the media. No coverage after that, but they were there. I did a rally after that. It was uh, last week also, the day after in uh, Calgary. 500 people over there, like the crowd tonight. The media were there, nothing on the news. So I think it was fake news. I think yeah, you're right. it, is, it, is a t it is absolutely a type of fake news by ignoring you. And then, you know, that also is the irony. The more they say, oh, you're racist and bigots, and the more they ignore you, it becomes this mysterious thing. And then what I think will happen over the course of tonight for any of you that are here, that maybe you're on the fence about what really is freedom, what is liberty, what does caring about the individual mean, well, you're going to walk out of here and go, wow, I didn't hear anything that was racist. I didn't even hear anything that was radical. All I heard was something that challenges just the mainstream factory settings that we're all sold on. And, and that's what we have to unfold. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's build on that. We, we live in a time where we have access to information, where we can get all sources of information from all different sides, but people seem to shut their eyes and they don't want to look. We have people outside that as we were coming in here, we were, we were pushed, we were, uh, we were threatened, um, they were calling us fascists, Nazis, everything else, and even though we were pointing out that we were accompanied by a, a Muslim immigrant, they didn't even want to look. So 
how do we counter that, that, that eye shutting and, and advise these people here who are, are trying to do it for the first time? You've had a lot of experience. We've all had a lot of experience having these conversations. How do they have thick skin and how do they break through? First of all, you must have the courage of your conviction. And, and And it is too bad that that happened. But uh, go back to the history. In Canada, we created out west the Reform Party 25 years ago. And maybe that's why we're popular out west. But 90% of our program is coming from the blue book that was a program of the Reform Party. But remember, Preston Mining was the leader of the, Pres of the Reform Party. And in the beginning, they were saying to Preston, he's a racist, and that happened to him. But everybody knows that Preston Manning is not a racist, was not a racist, but because he brought new ideas, and he was fighting for limited government, more freedom, and speaking about issues that were, that were important at that time. So that happened to us right now. We just have to go on, to go on, and to do the fight. And the fact that we are here tonight speaking about what we believe, I think that will give some courage to our candidates and people out there who share the same ideas to be out there and to speak about it. The more we speak about an idea is because we know that we have the best ideas. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> The more we speak about that, and the better it will be. You know, I have a lot of questions by journalists, and um, they are asking sometimes good questions. Uh, but they are asking me a good question is, what is the biggest challenges that you have as a leader of a new party? And the biggest one is to be known is to be out there because half of the population don't know that we exist. And the biggest challenge that we have, it's with the mainstream media. And now we use the social media and the more we'll be out there, the more I think people will be able to listen of what we are seeing. And I can tell you that it's a, it's a long journey. We started that a year ago, but it's only the beginning also. Uh, I, I think that uh, you and us and everybody here know that we have the right ideas for the right values, Western civilization values and ideas. So let's be out there. I don't know what is your experience in campus and... Well, I would also say that we have to stop giving these words so much power. And that's a, that's a challenge because when you get called all of these awful things, it hurts. You, you can, you know, sort of, it makes you feel like it's going to hurt some of your friendships and, and or relationships you, Dave, or like, things like that. It's Rosh Hashanah, right? It is. You're Jewish. Yeah. And you got I called a Nazi. With you crazy tonight. people. You see? <laughs> right? You see what's going on here? Yeah. Sorry yeah. about But I mean, the disconnect between reality and what these people out there are actually seeing is just beyond belief. But sorry to interrupt. The, well, it's the audacity of it. I mean, I actually, I, I wanted to be here regardless, and I'll, I'll go home and be with family tomorrow. But as Salim mentioned, it's, it's really celebrating the creation of the universe. This is creating something. This, what we're doing, having these conversations, is creating an ability to have more uh, freedom in the future. But, but just quickly on the words, stop giving them power. So when someone says that, that Max is racist, what would a racist want? Would a racist want a policy that would treat everyone as individuals and not by the color of their skin? Would a racist want low taxes? I mean, we could go through the litany of absurd things that none of his policies are racist. Or, or, or is this man a homophobe? Do you want to hold hands for a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> you know, come on. Get is this a homophobe? That was nice. Um, it, I, I'm feeling a little bit left out. Uh, Frank, yeah, me, where's our you, you, me later. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got you covered, man. Yeah. All right, now this is getting weird. The point is, <laughs> the point is, stop giving these words power. They, they are actually meaningless, and they're the last gasps of people that don't have much left. Those people don't have ideas out there. That really is the truth. Dave. Dave raises a great point, and, and the question was, how do you get a thick skin? Well, if ever you've been walking around in the summer, you know how you get a thick skin on your feet. You just keep getting the blisters. You just keep walking. You keep hitting the rocks, and you hit the rocks until you get those calluses. And, and for each one of you here tonight, 
I, I'm speaking as a candidate, we have to have thick skins, but even coming through that door, you are developing a thick skin. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 And, and the, the thing to remember is that a thick skin doesn't just happen, but you have to be intentional about it. It's like a muscle. You pick up something that's a bit heavy, and then you pick up something heavier, and you pick up something heavier. We need to take action. We need to stand up. We need to speak out when we need to speak out. We need to stand up when we need to stand up. You need to come in through the door, through the people out there who are trying to stop you, and you need to come in here and say, no, I stand for freedom. Right on. And remember too that if it gets to you and if you're taking it really seriously walk away but make a commitment to come back and the other thing that I try to live by is always give better than you get so when they're doing that to you give them a little bit better and you can win people over I've done it I've seen it uh, people awaken they have their own journeys and, and that's what you're trying to engender for sure yeah. so getting into something more specific um, both of our countries have an immigration issue and have a border issue and have issues of and it seems you can't even have a discussion about these issues without uh, being called a racist or a xenophobe or any other uh, title like that so how do we solve real problems if we can't even have discussions about things that are actually a problem all right first of all I think we uh, must start the discussion, and that's what we did at the PPC. But yes, it can be tough someday. And uh, but I, I'm always saying that you know I want to appeal appeal to your intelligence, not to your emotion. So when people are saying bad things about us, they don't want to have any discussion on the core of the policy. And so the more we speak about that, the better it is. And I just want to let you know that. Uh, on immigration, when we were just entering this building, people were saying that we were anti-immigration. We're not, and we're not. We're proud. As you know, this country has been built by Francophone, Anglophone, First Nation, Inuits, and immigrants from all over the world. We just want fewer immigrants, and we want more of them uh, must be economic immigrants, and that's why we have an immigration policy to fulfill our economic needs. But the other politicians, they're afraid. But we're not radical speaking about immigration in Canada. If you look in other countries, you have the discussion in the US, you have the discussion in, in, in Europe, but 49% of our population want us to have that discussion. So let's have it, and uh, they don't that they don't have any arguments that will be solid against our proposal. Uh, we're, not, we're not racist, we're not for mass immigration, we're not anti-immigration. We just want to have fewer of them that will come and share our values and being sure that we have an interview with each one of them like we did in the past. We have a point system in our country that must go better than right now. And before in the past, if you speak French in Canada or English, you had more points. And we know that it's easier for a, an immigrant to integrate our society, be part of our society, if they speak the, 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 one of the two official languages. But now this point system is not the same that it was in the past. So we need to review that and having a debate. Uh, but the good news is I'll be on the stage to have that debate with the other leader. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Max and I have, have discussed immigration in the past. We've had time to, to be together. And, and it's really difficult to say all the reasons why our policy is the right policy. I mean, when uh, Max came to Cambridge and, and we had a chance to discuss our immigration policy, we did it. We had to actually hold that event in the living room uh, of, of a friend uh, in his house because people just like those who are outside shut down our other event. They threatened the business owner until they were afraid to hold the event. And that's in Canada. Remember, this isn't the Communist Soviet Union. This was Canada. Indeed. So, but, 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 you know, we've talked about it. And something that it, I, I want to look at our policies and say, 
not only are they the best rationally, they are the best for compassion. And let me just show you this. Listen, we've got great research out there. Uh, there's the Harvard economist, George Borges. He's been studying immigration for 30 years. He says, if you want to raise the wages of the working poor, you've got to lower immigration. Because if you have an oversupply of newcomers into jobs, it keeps those wages too low. There's no incentive to business. By lowering immigration, we're actually helping the poor. And we've got to make that known, because this is why our policies make sense. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and for too long, for too long, we have ceded the moral ground to the left. And they say, well, we want to have more government spending because it's going to do more. And it doesn't. It doesn't. We've got policies that not only help the economy, but help the poor. Not only will lower immigration help raise wages, wages it'll also help make housing more affordable. It will. And finally, I mean, this, we didn't want this to be a policy discussion because it's super boring. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to turn it over to Dave to talk about immigration in the U.S. because it is a, it's crazy there. Good luck. But the last thing, lower immigration is also better for new immigrants because it allows them to integrate into society and it makes the people who are already here more welcoming. And the work of Eric Kaufman at the University of London has shown that. And if we want to be the best people we can be to the immigrants coming to our country, lower is better. But what's it like in the U.S., Dave? Well, I won't be presumptuous enough to come to Canada and tell you guys how to run immigration <laughs> policy in your country. That being said, if Bernie Sanders becomes president, I'm moving here. So. <laughs> <laughs> See? We know, we know that you will pass the value test. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I will brush up on my French. Um, <laughs> look, I, I mean, I, of course I agree with the, the basic premises of what you guys have laid out here. Every country, there's a reason that countries have borders. Countries have borders so that they can decide what is right within those borders, right? America and Canada have you know, overlapping, say, uh, interests and values on, you know, probably 99% of the issues, really, the people of Canada and America, yet at the same time, we are not one country. There is a border that separates us, and you guys are allowed to decide what you want to do, what is right for you, and we're allowed to do what is right for us, and sometimes those might have yeah. some competing interests, and then we have to negotiate that. Um, so without getting too far down, like, a, a policy part of this, I would say not only does every country have to decide, it's their, it's their duty. It's almost the most important duty. And that's why the immigration conversation is so awful because you can quite literally, and I'm sure you guys have seen these videos on Twitter, you can see videos where basically Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and the rest of the Democratic politicians, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, 10 years ago were saying virtually the same thing that Donald Trump is saying now. now He's orange and his hair is crazy and he's got a strange affect when he's speaking and all that. But that just shows you that what, what's happening here unfortunately is becoming a team sport and not something based in honest, sound policy. And it seems to me that Max is the guy trying to reset this for you guys. And that, again, that's why I'm thrilled to be here, really. And on the, you know, on the, the lack of skilled workers, it's always a question that they will throw at you. The, the solution is not only immigration. The first solution is for the entrepreneurs in this country to be able to reinvest for being more productive, uh, and, that, that's, and we want to help them to be able to reinvest because we have a policy to lower taxes, a flat tax, and all that. But the second it's to be able to raise, uh, like you just said, the salaries. We don't, we don't want here in Canada to be cheap labor. You know, if you raise your salaries, you'll be able to have more people. And the third one must be immigration. If it's always the first one, like you said, people will still have the, a low salary and they won't. Uh, so now we, we have a current platform for small business, for immigration, and also to be sure that Canadians will have the right salary that they, uh, they expect. 
so that's why we need to look at our immigration and being sure that that's, it will fulfill our economic needs, but not opening the borders like uh, Justin Trudeau is doing right now. And, yeah. and don't you guys find it curious that uh, the same people who will tell you that our nations are racist and patriarchal and homophobic and Islamophobic and all of those words are the same people that want to welcome everybody here to share in the horror? Isn't that a little? <laughs> Isn't that a little bizarre? Yeah. A little. Yeah. So when you're when you're in politics, obviously, and also when you're in the alternative media, it it seems clear that the media almost has its own platform and policies, and then if you deviate from that, you're going to be demonized. And a recent example is uh, Greta Thunberg is is touring around Canada and touring around the world. <laughs> In favor of carbon taxes, and we're mentioning the economy, and I don't think that's going to be very good for the economy. Um, I'm going to bring this up because you're here. There was the Covington kids, uh, and they were, they were demonized in the media for wearing Make America Great Again hats. They were targeted. They were demeaned. They were, they were destroyed. I think they were doxxed. When it comes to Greta Thunberg, you can't criticize her ideas or you're labeled as attacking a 16-year-old. But we really need to have a discussion around climate change and carbon taxes and these things. So how do we go about this when we're fighting almost all of the established powers? Uh, we are fighting, yes, you're right, and also the media. Uh, the bias of the media on climate change. I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, they were saying, you know, the fires on our planet right now, they are the worst ever what happened in, in uh, Brazil. But the BBC did a big piece about that and they look at the photo uh, satellite photos and you know we had more fires on our planet 15 years ago than this year but you don't see that on the mainstream media so what we we want to do we just want to have a conversation but now it's supposed to be emerge climate change emergency and for them i understand their strategy if it's an emergency you don't have time to think or to uh, uh, do more research they they want us to act right now and they don't want us to debate but for us there's no climate change emergency and we want to be sure to have a debate about that before changing our way of life and that's too important and i think that the more the more crisis they believe in the better it is for us. You know, the common sense people understand that the climate is always changing and it will change also in the future. But we believe that the main reason for that, it is not human activities on this planet. That can be a part of that, but not the main one. So, it's, it is a little bit difficult in Canada to have that debate, but uh, we are starting that debate, and uh, we're not alone. In all our policies, we have a majority of Canadians on our side, or a huge minority. So we want to be a voice for these people, and... Uh, well, I find this to be a really fascinating one because it's becoming the next one sort of like race that people are very nervous to talk about, right? It really is becoming that type of thing. And what I've found is that people on the right, when I go to events like this, it's not necessarily that you're rejecting science or you don't want to listen to 97% of the climate scientists or any of the things that they'll, that they'll tell you. I mean, they're the ones telling you you're rejecting science, and then if you tell them how many genders there are, they freak out, but... Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Not to be a dick, but there's two. Um, but, but what they're sort of doing, what they're sort of doing with that is they're saying, bow to us now and bow forever. The earth, the earth is ending in 12 years. And of course, it's, it's ridiculous and absurd. And what I have found, though, is that when I've talked to you guys and I've, and I've had people on my show where we talk about nuclear energy or other ways that, that we could blend a public and private way to deal with uh, environmental issues, people are totally open to that. And I suspect you guys probably are too. You don't want, this, you don't want something jammed down your throat and then forced uh, to then expand government. And I think we're all sort of in the same place on that. Quickly, though, on the, on the first part of your question, which was about uh, Greta Thornburg and then the Covington kids and the way the double standard works, right? So if it's a child of the left, you got to lay off them. If it's a ch child on the right, you can say, I'm going to punch them in the face on Twitter, and you get a 1,000 retweets. Um, you guys may know the story of Kyle Kashub, who was one of the survivors of the Parkland shooting in Florida. Uh, 
Kyle's an absolutely incredible kid, and when, after the shooting, when, when there were all the marches uh, against gun rights, Kyle became a Second Amendment advocate, a pro-gun advocate. And, uh, and he's, just, he's just spectacular. And he, uh, it, it was uncovered that when he was in high school, when he was 15, 16 years old, he had a Google Doc with some friends, and they said, they said some bad stuff. And it was joking, nonsensical way kids are that we've all done some stupid stuff in our past. What happened, Harvard actually rescinded his offer. He graduated number one in his class. Harvard rescinded his offer. They did take David Hogg, who is the, the progressive out, out of that crew, right? But, but you know what? So Harvard re rejected, uh, rescinded his offer. So you know what we did? He now works for us. He works for the Rubin Report. <laughs> And, and he told me, he told me my dad's thrilled with me because I was about to have him go $400,000 into debt and now I've got a job, <laughs> an actual job. So I think there are ways to beat some of the double standards by playing a little bit of a different game, right? Just play a different game, figure out how to be smart and nimble and, and stay true to your beliefs and you can find answers to some of these things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I, I come at this whole thing, by profession I'm a social scientist, this, I'm at Laurier University and being a politician is not my, my ideal gig, but it, it's, <laughs> you, you know, you do your duty. <laughs> and, uh, and honestly, uh, I just want, I want the facts. And coming into this, I really didn't have a firm position either way on climate change, global warming. but. What I did have a firm position on was I've seen again and again in academia where there is an established doctrine, a doctrine that you cannot compromise and you cannot question, to the point where they will suppress the facts on the other side. So we've moved away from the scientific model that said we're going to have competing ideas so that it will be, be self-correcting. Because you've got these ideas against these ideas, and, and somewhere the, the truth comes to the top. But now, you look at the behavior of these climate scientists, and I'm thinking in particular, there's a guy at uh, the University of East Anglia, and his name is uh, Phil Jones. And Phil Jones is the lead researcher there, and he's also on the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC, from the UN. And there's clear evidence. The UK government has, has said to him, listen, you are in breach. There have been over 104 freedom of information requests for the data where you are claiming global warming and you've only answered about 10. Now, when you have an academic who refuses to let another academic check their data, that's a red flag. Another thing, there was a WikiLeaks for this fella and in some of these emails, he says specifically that he's bragging that he's been able to get onto the editorial boards of certain journals and he's able to suppress or deny the publications of other scientists who have gone against his global warming findings. That's not science anymore. Yeah. That's ideology. <clears throat> yeah. My point in this is, my point in this, if I wasn't, if I wasn't already skeptical, I now really have a lot of reason to be skeptical. <laughs> I really do. But when I say to my colleagues at the university, listen, I'm skeptical, you would have thought that I, that I pooped on their carpet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's gone that far. And there, there, are, there were heresies in the past, and there are heresies today, and one of them is this idea that you would even question, even question global warming. Well, when, when you have some scientists speaking about consensus, consensus, it's a word for politician, <laughs> not scientist. You know, you know that they're doing politics and not doing research, but they're doing research, but it's, it's, it's always not based 100% on facts. They're doing politics, the, these people. Uh, so for me, I don't like the word consensus. <laughs> I prefer conviction. I prefer facts and reason. And that's, most, that's the most important for us. And we'll see. I believe in the near future, that's a, a, a religion right now, climate change. But I believe in a couple of years from now, maybe a couple of months from now, people will 
I don't want to insult anybody, but wake up a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The point is that if you use a plastic straw, you should be shot. <laughs> <laughs> on that, we can agree. Yeah, yeah. All right. so, on that, we can agree. Well, it's, it's nothing new in science. Like, science always develops these consensus, and then the people who break them with new evidence are always besmirched. There's a long history of this in archaeology and in geology. Uh, one of the consequences, of course, of, of uh, consolidating around consensus and then having a society and a culture that doesn't foster debate, having a media culture, a political culture that doesn't allow debate, is you end up with politicians that instead of trying to tell the truth about subjects, get into vote buying schemes, whether it's through corporate welfare or through foreign aid or through boutique tax credits. Did you know the most important thing in Canada is a $2,000 camping tax credit? Did you know that that was <laughs> more finally, important than what we're doing? Finally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, paddling a canoe, right, if we're still buying this. So, um, oh, I thought she said then you get a free canoe. Which, oh, well, they could. <laughs> now I'm really moving here. Oh, yeah, free canoes. But I think, I think one of the things you're doing, Max, is trying to push back against the, uh, the, the whole vote buying and corporate welfare. And, and, uh, yes, and um, it's going well, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's going well because I like competition. You know, I'm a free market guy. I like competition, but nobody want, wants to compete on our turf, the freedom and, and less government and no vote, vote buying. And doing that, uh, you, need, you need to explain your policies a little bit more. And people appreciate that. Actually, in the news today, all the promises from all the other political parties. I think the cost of all that was $100 billion. But, and we still have a couple of days before yeah. the end of the election. <laughs> so before the day of the election. So they try to buy votes. But uh, for us, our commitment is to cut. We want to balance the budget as soon as possible. And after that, when we'll have surplus, yes, we'll give you back your money. But, David said that he is not a real politician, and, and, and our candidates are not real politicians because they're new in politics. And you know, that's great. That's great because you don't want to be a politician. You don't want to be a traditional politician. Being a traditional politician, people, you know, don't believe in politician anymore. That's why we have 30% of the population that didn't vote in Canada at the last federal election. And so we have to be different. And that's what I like, you know. I, I'm telling what I believe in based on principle. If you like it, come with us. If not, you know, the, you have the choice. <laughs> you have the choice with the other parties. So we won't play that game to buy votes. And I think people appreciate that. It, it, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it can be risky as a politician, but uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a beautiful risk doing politics differently. The, the one thing. <laughs> I have to disagree with Max on one thing. He said that, that there's us and then you have a choice with the other parties. Reality suggests that there's us and then there's this really one other party. Yeah. There's the liberal, con, and because I can't tell the difference between them. Yeah, you're right. But there really is one party that is different. And if you're here, you know what that party is. <laughs> so David, I want to target you for a second because yes, you, you left the left and I'm assuming your husband left with you in some way. Um, I was watching uh, Joe Rogan experience with Ben Shapiro, I can't remember when it was filmed, but he apparently couldn't come to your wedding for religious reasons. And uh, in Canada we have this bill called C-16 which can ruin your life for misgendering somebody. It's uh, a travesty if you ask me. Um, where do you think laws like that lead and, gov and governance like that lead and do you think they're necessary? Well, no, they're evil. That's the easy answer, right? I mean, they're truly... Any law that would compel speech or punish you for speech, I would view as evil. Now, look, in the United States, we have the First Amendment where we have extra protections around speech that I think actually makes most of the world jealous of us. And it's funny because if you listen to most of the lefties in the U.S., they'll tell you how everybody hates the U.S., everybody's so disappointed in us and all this stuff. And it's like, no, nobody's leaving. Everyone still wants to come. We're still, <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. you know. Nobody, Lena Dunham, she's still here. Deborah Messing, she doesn't go anywhere. I bought her a ticket, you know. Um, 
but, uh, but I should mention Jordan here, because obviously one of the things that put Jordan Peterson on the map was fighting this bill. Yeah. And you know, if you watch the way the media operated, it was suddenly that this Canadian professor was now th this leader of the alt-right who's a transphobe, and he hates gay people, and all of these things. And I did a hundred some odd shows in about two dozen countries with him in, in the course of a year. Um, and not only did I never hear him say one bigoted word, one racist word, one transphobic word, every show, there were trans people in the crowd. There were gay people in the crowd, black people, Muslim people, it doesn't matter. Uh, all he was saying is that the government shouldn't be able to tell you what to say. We have got to protect that. That, that is what we must protect more than anything else. I mean, that's, that really is the simplest way to say it. Um, you know, and it's funny because I, I don't bring up my sexuality. I don't think it's, it's relevant in any way other than, and I know the nature of why you brought it up, because that's the game that they play. But I don't want any extra credits, and more than anything else, I don't want any extra rights. I want the exact same rights as everyone else. Guess what? That's what I had. That's what I had. So. So I would never want to use my identity, my, my immutable characteristics, I would never want to use them as a cudgel over anyone else. And sadly, identity politics has tricked a huge swath of people all over the world that somehow the things that they're born with, that they can't change, have far more importance than the ideas they come up with, than the thoughts that they have, their actions. That, that is the reverse of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. Yeah. And, and that's how perverse this thing is, and that's why we have to turn it around. Yeah. I just want to I just want to add that for us our policy is easy and simple we're going to repeal that that's it <laughs> that's it repeal that bill yeah there, there are times Max when being a People's Party candidate and I think probably being a People's Party supporter feels a lot like that uh, did you ever watch that Rudolph cartoon, that you know, Rudolph animated thing? They had the Island of Misfit Toys. Yeah. <laughs> so s sometimes I feel like we are the Island of Misfit Toys. And, and, <laughs> and, that's, and that's okay. But, but the reason I say that is we in the People's Party have this ability to attract a really diverse bunch of people because we don't care what your sexual orientation yeah. is. We don't care what your color is, your ethnicity, your religion. We don't care. We do care that you, you want the freedoms that we enjoy here. And this really is what unifies a nation. It's going to unify the party. But what's refreshing about it is it also makes us forget our petty differences. Like when we were at that conference in Gatineau, yeah. I'm with people who I normally wouldn't been hanging out with, <laughs> right? Seriously, it's the island of misfit toys. But, but suddenly we all have this common cause that we want freedom. Yeah. And that is so important that it can overcome our differences. And so this is something that, that it, it's not just a political party, it's a movement. And as you say, this is what will rebuild Canada. Yeah. Like you said, identity politics and, and vote buyings, and we don't we don't play that game. And uh, I like to tell the anecdote, and I think you must know that one. And I'll I'll be very short. When I was running to be the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, I've been invited in Toronto with a Muslim uh, organization, and they had a lot of conservative members. And they told me and our team, Maxime, you're the only conservative leadership candidate that didn't come to see us f because we have a lot of our members that are conservative and we have a list of questions and if you want to come. And so I went there and they asked all the questions. And at the end the lady said, you know, the last one is the, more imp the most important question. If you want to take time before you answer, it's okay. If you want to go back to Ottawa and think about it and write, <laughs> write back the answer, it's okay. I look at her, what's the question? My God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And she said, you know, our members will read the last one to decide for which candidates they will vote. So, okay. So I asked the question, and I'll see. And she, she asked the question, you don't know that an anecdote? No? No? Yes or no? So she asked the question, she said, what will, we, what will you do for the Muslim community? And I look at her, that's the question? She said, yes. 
I look at her, I say, nothing. <laughs> I, will do, I will do nothing for the Muslim community. I will do nothing for the Jewish community. I will do nothing for the Christian community. And I look at her, I said, but I will do everything for you as a Canadian. <laughs> So speaking, speaking of identity politics, we, we have to talk about this. Uh, in Canada, we have this thing called the Multi Multiculturalism Act, which yeah. more or less, well, it deploys, it, it's, it's not that we're against other people celebrating their culture, but it deploys public money towards balkanizing the country, essentially, and it doesn't promote a core Canadian identity. And it leads to things like Justin Trudeau saying that Canada does not have a core national identity. You knew that one? That is. So you guys disagree with that? You think, <laughs> okay, we actually have that. Um, you've talked about repealing it, and, and I think that would go a long way to ending identity politics. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, we don't need a legislation to tell, to tell us who we are as Canadians. So yes, Canada, it's a diverse country. We're proud of that. What we don't like, we don't like and we don't want the federal government to spend money to celebrate every uh, uh, diverse uh, celebration uh, like I'll give you, I like to give that example, you know, the Chinese year, you know, the, the, the Chinese people, Canadian from Chinese origin, if they want to celebrate their Chinese year, that's perfect, uh, go and they're free to do it, but the government must not spend money to celebrate that. I think the government must spend money to celebrate what unites us as a country. And so repeal that legislation and, uh, and, and we'll be able to save some money and we'll use that to promote what unites us as a country, our history, our culture, uh, our values as Canadians. And that's what Canadians, be I believe, want. And This is where you really have to watch the media closely because the low resolution, to quote Jordan Peterson, version of this would be they'd hear you say, oh, I don't want to give you anything as Muslims or you, we don't want to fund Chinese New Year or something. And the low resolution version of that is they'll spin it in a way that it sounds like you're saying something against Muslim people or you're saying something against Chinese people or Jewish people or whatever it is when that is obviously 100% the reverse of what you just said, and we all know that. So you really have to see the way the, the media plays with this, and then be ready, to answer an earlier question, be ready then to challenge the people who are coming after you for supporting this guy, or for having any of these beliefs, be ready to fight them on their ground and go, no, no, he doesn't want special treatment, he wants you Guy standing right in front of me, he wants you to be treated the exact same way as everybody else, you know? And that's what freedom is. That's really what freedom is. Yeah. Early on, uh, maybe some of you were there when Max uh, made the announcement about the uh, immigration policy. Yeah. And then um, the media, they covered it, and the Toronto Star covered it, and the CBC covered it. and. Uh, one of the things that they really took Max to task for, they said, and, and he wants a values test. They were really, they, they, they just drove them crazy. He wants a values test for, for immigrants. And I was there, and, and Max said, I'm going to tell you what the values are. I want equality between men and women. I want to make sure, yeah, right. I want to make sure that Whatever your sexual orientation, you can live your life. Yeah. I, I want to make sure that people respect the rule of law and that think democracy is, is going to be what they will support. And all these things he said were codified in our Charter of Rights and Freedom. They're the things that we all want and desire. So my question for the media, who were so scathing about this, which one of these rights wouldn't you want someone to have? <laughs> I mean, it, we really have to flip the script on them and say, what, what are you saying? You don't want newcomers to Canada to respect women like they respect men? You don't want that? 
Because please tell me which one of these we should get rid of, because it <laughs> sounds dangerous to me. <laughs> also, you know, your, your, country, your country is your home, and I think you should treat it like your home. I believe that people can say anything they want outside of my home, but I don't invite anyone into my home at all times to say whatever they want. I don't invite people in my home that would be actual homophobes or regal racists or anything like that. I'm not trying to put them in jail outside of my home, but there's a, I have a fence in front of my house. I have a lock on my door. Believe it or not, it's pretty crazy. And there's a, <laughs> and there's a reason we have those things, and I think we should start thinking of, thinking of our countries as our home and we should be as welcoming as we can be but we shouldn't just have a door that's open for everybody at all times regardless of anything just so that we kind of feel better about ourselves mm. yeah. the left is is fond of as we're, we're kind of talking about here inverting the meaning of words so that equality in their lexicon now means you know, assessing you based on your, your intersectionality point score and dividing you. So it's, it's a flip, it's a f uh, flip script. And I, I think we have to wrap this up soon. But uh, I wanted to ask you guys, what, do, what individual experience was the craziest that you've had with the sorts that we had outside today? If you could think of one thing that you've run into uh, in terms of personal experience, the craziest thing you've experienced. Oh my God! Yeah. I, I mean, I could start. <laughs> I, I, you know, I immediately go. Well, I can tell you about yesterday, <laughs> right? Well, so, I just got called a Nazi on the first night of Rosh Hashanah. That's welcome well, to Canada. <laughs> um, that might win, you know. <laughs> uh, yesterday, yes. So I woke up yesterday, uh, and. Uh, as all good politicians do, I'm learning what it is to be a good politician. So I, I went on Google and I saw, has anybody in the media mentioned me today? <laughs> and uh, I always look for Max first and then I look for myself. Right? <laughs> so, so yesterday, CBC had a story and it was saying that this, it was local CBC, uh, this little boy, five-year-old boy, had written a letter to local politicians local politicians, because he was concerned about the death of the polar bears. Fair enough. And the cute, really cute kid, really just curly hair, beautiful. And uh, of course, in, and it said, Dave Haskell did not respond. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm frantic. I, I've got five kids. I mean, yeah, I love kids. I, I don't want to disappoint a child. I'm frantic. I'm thinking, how could I have overlooked this? How could I have overlooked this? I'm searching my email box. I call up the secretary of the writing association. Did you get a letter and not hand it down to me? There's something from a kid about polar bears? <laughs> Nothing. Turns out we didn't get a letter at all. And then, you know, I slowed down for a bit and I thought, wait a minute. CDC didn't even check with me. Did you ever receive this letter? This whole thing was fake news. They did note, oh, the other candidates, they answered the letter. I, I then I quickly set off an email to the CBC News. Are you kidding me? You didn't even contact me. I received no letter. And now I'm getting emails. Why don't you like kids? <laughs> So, so that was just yesterday. I mean, I could go on, but, but that's a typical day as a People's Party candidate, I'll let you know. <laughs> I, I feel like I should give you the big finish here, so I'll, I'll just quickly, I'll, I'll do one that I think probably most of you saw about three months ago. Uh, front page, Sunday, New York Times, a picture of about 40 YouTubers, and the headline is, uh, if some of you remember it exactly, you can yell at it, it was something like the, the rise of the alt-right on YouTube, something to that effect. <laughs> And of course, my picture was in there, and uh, Jordan Peterson, and Shapiro, and Milton Friedman. I mean, a real, Whoa. yeah, because oh, no, no, no. there's Eclectic. nothing, Eclectic. yeah, like a dead libertarian economist to lead you to Pepe. Um, <laughs> And, and the whole article was, I mean, the, the article truly was a work of fiction because what they did was the guy, the author, by the way, his name is Kevin Roos, which is the greatest name for a New York Times <laughs> author ever. If you didn't get that, think about it for a sec. Roos. Roos. Um, so uh, 
the premise was that this kid, he found a kid, you know, like a 20-something year old kid who was kind of on the left, but then started watching YouTube videos, became kind of on the right, and then at the end, he actually ends up a lefty because he finds lefty YouTube and that saves him. So the whole title of the, yeah, that was, I swear on my life, yeah. So the whole title of the article was wrong because the idea was that he went, became a righty, you know, an evil alt righty or whatever it is. Anyway, I invited the guy on my show, and of course he doesn't respond to any of that stuff. But, but my dad, who has subscribed to the New York Times for 45 years, I mean longer than I'm alive, uh, had to go to the coffee shop that day, that Sunday, and have a woman that lives in the neighborhood come up to him with the paper with my picture in it and say, I didn't know that David is a uh, leader of the alt-right. <laughs> And my dad said, well, either did I. <laughs> um, but, but that's what we're up against. It's not just the false cries. It's the way the media plays into it. You know, and, and look, it's in a weird way, you can see the people out there and it seems kind of scary or it seems, um, it, it, it seems like it's sort of taking over everything. That, that's just a bunch of misguided young people that, that eventually as the world progresses and we get these ideas out there, we can fix some of them. But it's, this is a holistic problem between the ideas, fighting identity politics, fighting the media, fighting the political establishment, all these things, and we all have to figure out what role to play. And I would say more than anything else, for you guys, it's probably just being a little bit braver. But you're already here, so you're already doing it. So I don't mean that in any judgmental way, truly. I mean, it's, it's just about being a little bit braver. We live in the freest societies in the history of the world right now, really, for all the badness that you think is out there. Canada is still an exceptionally free country, for now. And, and that's what you have to fight for. Frank, I'll do my partition. <laughs> I won't answer your question. <laughs> because I want to finish on a positive note. And uh, so, you know, a lot of bad things can happen. And as you know, if you look at the news, you'll see. But the best thing for us and for me was the creation of the People's Party of Canada. Um, you know, some days it can be tough. You need to have, uh, yes, uh, tight, uh, sk yeah, tight skin and uh, being ready. But you know, it's my best, best time in politics. I like what I'm doing. We have great people, great candidates, and, um, and we are fighting for the real fight, real values, and for what we believe. And the core of our principle is we at the People's Party, we will believe in you, we believe in people, we believe that you can do what you want to do in life. You don't need the government every, every time, every day in your life. We want a limited government, more freedom. And, and, and fighting for that, for me, uh, it's, uh, it's great because I'm, I'm myself and there's no more political correctness. And uh, we are doing politics differently based on principles and we don't try to please everybody. So the best, um, it's my best time in politics and I'm really, I'm the 14th of September, just remember that date, a year ago. That was the date where we created the People's Party of Canada. So, but it's only, it's, it's only the beginning, it's only the beginning and we'll be there, we'll be there and we'll see what will happen in a couple of weeks from now. But having discussion like that and I think people will have, Canadians will have this ki these kind of discussion in their house uh, around the kitchen table and the more they will speak about what they believe in for a better country and a freer country, the more uh, we'll have support. So that's fun. <laughs> So, obviously, I want to thank all of you again for coming out and braving the outside and getting here and reminding you, as, as Max has just said, we're called the People's Party because we're made of people. You are the People's Party, and you'll all be the People's Party. So I appreciate everything that you have done tonight as well.
And with that, I would like to invite the media up onto the stage for a media scrum so that you can ask our friends. us, uh, our friends <laughs> in the media, to come up and ask us all the questions that they would want. And I wish you all adieu. Thanks to Dave Rubin for Thank coming. You guys. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Respond to uh, the reception you've had today. Oh, I'm very. But the reception in the building or outside the building? Ah, both. <laughs> both. No, in the building. I'm very pleased. People are here to learn a little bit more about the party, and we had a good discussion with Dave and everybody here. But the reception outside the building, they have the right. They have the right to protest, but protest when they protest peacefully, that's okay. When they're not, you know, that's not the Canadian way of protesting. Uh, but at the end, you know, I'm here to speak and I have the right to speak about what I believe and these people with me on the stage also, they have the same right. So yes, I believe in freedom of speech. I believe that people can have the right to process, protest, but I believe at the same time when they're doing that, they, mo they must do that peacefully. You must be uh, very happy to see such a, a great response and a huge audience willing to brave the, uh, the protesters outside. I understand that there was arrests and altercations. But does that give you hope to go forward into the last two weeks of election? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, that's, that is uh, giving me a lot of energy to go on. And, but we had a great crowd here. But also when I'm traveling across the country, like I said, I was in uh, Calgary a couple of days ago and we had 500 people over there. In Vancouver, we had another 500 people over there. So something is happening and we'll see what will happen the 21st of October. Thank you. Merci. This response tonight sort of goes against the usual American narrative of Canada being a, a very left-wing socialist society. <laughs> Does this sort of go against what the Americans think um, about Canada? So again, it's hard to say what the Americans think because, you know, we're all over the place just like you guys are. So I would say, sadly, you know, Americans, we don't think that much about the rest of the world. Everyone thinks about us. We don't have that much time to think about everybody else. But what I can tell you is this. In the last year and a half, I visited two dozen or so countries. And what I found is that even in places like Sweden that are, you know, thought of as the, the Bernie Sanders sort of socialist utopias, there are plenty of people that care about freedom there. There are plenty of people that don't like identity politics. There are plenty of people that want to fight uh, to keep the government out of out of their bedroom and out of their wallet and the rest of those things. So, so no, this doesn't surprise me at all. And actually, if anything, the more that you see the ever encroaching progressive ideology infect every part of everyone's lives, who they can talk to and what they can talk about and the rest of it, and who they can address a certain way or whatever else, uh, the more that you're going to see events like this and and candidates that, like Maxine come out and and be forces for good because it's a it's a countermeasure to that yeah yeah you got it your impression tonight david of the uh, turnout uh it was a full house and i i was not pleasantly surprised just by that i, I suspected that we were going to have a full house but what i really was impressed by was the level of passion in the room and you don't see this at other political rallies. You don't see this with the Liberals. Uh, of course you don't. I mean, they're embarrassed, right? They're, actually, I think they're, they come in in masks now. But, but this is really unique. And I think it speaks to the fact... Is that a word? It speaks to the fact? It is now. It is now. <laughs> it speaks to the fact that the people who are involved in the People's Party have conviction. And that is more important than the money and the the established uh, side of the party because that is what changes society. People who actually believe in something. And so I saw that tonight and that was encouraging. Now we have Dave Rubin up here. Why go to an American celebrity? Are there not any freedom-loving Canadians up here to help Maxime out on stage? Besides <laughs> yourself and Frank Vaughn, of course. Right. Well, there are. There are. I think that Dave and Max had a special connection because yes. Dave had them on, on his show. And uh, they're both libertarian, uh, you know, at the end of the day. Max has that mix between libertarian, conservative, classical liberal. And I guess Dave does too. So because they had that connection, it just seemed to make sense. And the one thing about Dave that is a little bit unique, apart from other celebrities who may be YouTube-oriented celebrities, he's funny too. And so when you have a... An event like this, you want people to laugh as well as to say, hmm. 
Uh, so much, hmm, we do that a lot. So to be able to chuckle a bit was good for the audience and for us on stage. How's it going on the hustings? It is, it's really tiring. It really is. Because I'm not only running against the other candidates, I'm running against the media. Yeah. And they, they are uh, an opposition force that I didn't think that I'd have to contend with. Often you think at the local level that the media is going to be more fair. But I think increasingly the local media is watching what the national media is misrepresenting about the People's Party. And so they just have a chip on their shoulder and, and they think it's a noble thing to provide skewed and biased coverage. Well, good luck. Well, thank you. I appreciate it.